Hello, this webinar is brought to you by the Flood CABA Flood Working Group and it's on the NFM monitoring, how to estimate storage, roughness and losses. The CABA mentoring and technical team uh, is made up of six of us. I've highlighted the ones in green who have been involved in the development of the AGOL tool to record NFM monitoring and the guidance which has been developed with the Environment Agency. Uh, you can reach us by hitting the feedback tab on the AGOL tool and that goes straight to Will who's in the bottom right hand corner uh, and him and myself and Michelle uh, are there to answer any questions that you've got on the tool and on monitoring so uh, please do use that uh, feedback tab. <coughs> Slide three. I'm going to break this webinar down into three sections on storage, roughness, and losses, each of which are recorded within the AGOL tool. If we start with storage, um, in each section I'm going to go through the kind of the I, what we would record in an ideal world so that we understand what the kind of the theory is and then what we can actually record. And the difference between those two shows us how uh, much effort should be put into the monitoring work. Okay, so let's go to slide four. So in theory, um, to measure storage, we would measure the area, the depth and the volume um, of the area of storage. Um, however, what we actually, we really need is the rate of change of volume. And that is also is dependent on the leakage through the large woody debris dam and the rate of leakage into groundwater and other losses. So all that is really quite a, a difficult calculation. And if we could do all that, we would then have to compare it, slide five, with the flow hydrograph um, in the river so that we could plot the rate of change of storage, which I've plotted here in orange. Um, and show the difference that made to the red graph, which is the uh, flow hydrograph in the unimpacted stream, and the blue hydrograph is the impacted flow after the NFM has been installed. And the two graphs, one is for a river with 25 cumic flow, and the other one is for a stream with a 2.5 cumic flow. And if we could do all that, then we'd get a good picture of how the storage filled up and changed the hydrograph but in reality this is only possible really with a model so let's have a look at what is actually practically possible slide six the first approved method and i've gone through these methods with uh, the environment agency program manager to make sure that they're all completely acceptable the first uh, approved method is the Mark 1 eyeball, which is surprisingly accurate. And it's just using very simple techniques like pacing out the area. Um, my, my pace is 110 paces to equals 100 meters. So, and it's actually a surprisingly accurate way of measuring distance. Or you can use the tape or an OS map. And that gives you the area. Then depth, um, again, that's just a ranging pole, um, a, a tape measure or potentially a clinometer, although they're actually not that easy to use, particularly for fine measurements. And then you measure the volume equals half the maximum depth times the area. Uh, one of the questions that came up um, in the live webinar was, doesn't this, um, <clears throat> doesn't this storage fill up um, and then uh, is irrelevant to the storm. And that's exactly what we were talking about in slide five. So yeah, this, this measurement of storage gives you an idea of how much storage is created, but it doesn't necessarily tell you um, when, that, when that's going to be used. Um, <clears throat> but it's, this is the number that you put into the AGOL tool. Uh, the second method, which is on slide seven, is using LIDAR and GIS. So this is a project where we, which we delivered a couple of years ago, where we put uh, enormous uh, tree trunks across the floodplain to create a kind of um, uh, a backing up of water along the floodplain. And what I did was I used LIDAR to identify the ground level at the lowest point where we put those tree trunks in. I then added the depth of the tree trunk so that's where the water will wear over and then I use that to create a contour on the map 
and if we go to slide eight, that gives you the area of inundation behind the um, the, the bund, or the in this case the woody bund, that was created. And this is a sort of approach that's uh, that's applicable for much bigger uh, projects um, and where you're creating bunds and so forth to to create storage. Uh, one of the questions that was asked in the live webinar was how good LiDAR is for this type of work. Um, I've always found it quite quite good. I haven't had any problems yet. Um, however, I am aware of colleagues who found LiDAR to be inaccurate, uh, particularly in heavily wooded areas. So it is something to always keep an eye open on for and work out whether you're, um, whether you're happy with the results. So again, you use the area, half max depth times area to give you the volume. All right, let's move on to slide nine. This is the kind of gold standard approach for measuring storage. And this allows us to, um, using level sensors or time-lapse photography, to measure the rate of change of storage and then compare it with stream flow measurements. Now, I know of a couple of examples where this has been done, and one of them um, from Josh in Trent Rivers Trust, I talked to him after the webinar and he said he's happy for people to contact him, so I will put his details on this slide. Um, this is very much the gold standard. Uh, we're not expecting this from any projects, but if we do get it, it's, um, it's a great piece of work if you can do it. Uh, it's quite intensive and takes um, quite a bit of effort. Okay, so let's move on to the final slide in this section, slide 10. And this is what the QNFM project, research project, is uh, doing, uh, where they're measuring using flumes. They're using very small catchments, micro catchments of one kilometre or less, because they, that's the only kind of size that you can really work with uh, if you're doing these kind of fine measurements. And they're using the backy approach before, after control impact, where you have twinned catchments. So you can see to do this properly, uh, as they are in the NERC projects, takes an enormous resource, and that really is not possible for any uh, of the DEFRA projects. Okay, let's move on to slide 12. And now we're talking about roughness. So same thing again, um, looking at what we would do in an ideal world. Um, the two uh, papers that I've put in onto these, this slide, uh, the, first, the larger of the two is a report from the United States Geological Survey, and they um, did a report back in the 80s on Manning's N, which is the calculation of roughness, the roughness coefficient which you use in the calculations, um, for a whole series of different floodplain woodlands. And this, all their work is based on observations of real events um, in mature woodlands, so really not something that is possible for us to, to do. The second smaller table shows the, um, the, the general Manning's N values for different types of land use. And I would like, just want to draw your attention to the one for forest versus orchard. So forest is about twice what it is for orchard, and we'll come back to that uh, a bit later on. So if we move on to the next slide, which is slide 13. So all we can actually do uh, is measure the area of trees planted or changed vegetation. So, for example, you know, roughening up an area by planting more sort of rougher natural vegetation or peat bog restoration. And one of the questions that we were given in the live webinar was why do we think that peat bog restoration changes roughness and it's to do with the micro topography um, of the sphagnum moss creates a very hillocky sort of um, <clears throat> land surface and that creates the roughness and and uh, which slows the flow down so if we go on to the next slide 14 large woody debris dams and river restoration also roughen up uh, a catchment and what you would record for a large woody debris dam would be the lower of the two polygons that I've put on this slide 15. Um, it's just the cross-sectional area of the large woody debris dam. Um, now there are a few questions came up in the live webinar about this um, and saying that it's not comparing apples 
uh, with apples because the area of the large woody debris dam is not really comparable with the area of forestry. That's okay because in the AGOL tool, we differentiate between a large woody debris dam and an area of forestry. So we can we can associate an area of an area with large woody debris dams and then a separate area with forestry. So we've we've got that covered in the tool. Um, the second polygon, the larger one, that's the area of river restoration where you've increased the roughness of that area and that's the area that you would record in the AGOL tool and you'd say that that's associated with um, <coughs> the river restoration. I think move on to slide 16, hedgerows and kested hedgerows. Again, what you want to record on slide 17 is the areas that I've highlighted there. Uh, it's the cross-sectional area of the hedgerows. Now, this is something that we're going to have to change in the AGOL tool because at the moment we don't differentiate between hedgerows and other features. So we will be putting that uh, new type into the tool. OK, so that's those are all the measurements that we need to give for um, for, for roughness. One final question that came in uh, in the live webinar was about um, whether and within this in the situation of a large woody debris dam, is it still relevant to, to record roughness, you know, during um because you know what happens during an event? Well the roughness stays the same throughout the event. The storage fills up and that you know that there is an argument to say that once it's filled up it's not providing any more benefit but the roughness that carries on um, slowing the flow all the way through the event okay let's move on to slide 19 and now we're talking about losses um, so there's losses up for that for evapotranspiration and interception that type of thing so um, it's a highly complex area of science. Um, there's some good reports from CEH um, and QNFM has been doing a complete literature review of this area um, and has identified that actually losses through evapotranspiration and forestry could be significant even in during events. So that's quite an interesting uh, piece of science and the paper is going to be published shortly. But uh, it's very much for the research groups to do that work. It's really not accessible to <coughs> any of the DEFRA projects, DEFRA 15 million projects. The same story for uh, losses down um, on the right hand side of the slide. Um, what determines the losses down is the infiltration. There's two processes going on. One is infiltration excess, where um, the soil doesn't have the is the, the rainfall is more intense than the soil is able to cope with and the second is saturation excess runoff and that's where the soil is full of water and therefore that there's more runoff all these quite complex processes and the evidence base is not good and that was identified um, in the working with natural processes document that the environment agency published and so again, it's not really possible for any of the DEFRA projects to um, uh, to measure this in great detail. So what we ask for in the AGOL tool, uh, go to slide 20, is um, for soil aeration, sward lifting or cover crops. All of these are about soil improvement. Slide 21, just record the area um, in the AGOL tool and that will associate itself with soil improvement and that's that's fine, that's all we need. Um, if we move on to slide 22 for SUDS, um, then it's slightly more complicated. So go on to slide 23 and what we want is the effective area um, that's draining to the SUDS. And that is a design parameter that you use when you're designing a SUD, so that should be relatively easy. And that's the area that we want to put into the AGOL tool. And then slide 24, um, if we if we are designing our um, our, <coughs> uh, our change in land use to increase losses uh, to the atmosphere, then again, all we're after in terms of cover crops, woodlands, wetlands, and so forth, slide 25, is the area and that's what we put into the AGOL tool. Okay, um, that's the end of the loss section, and we now move on to slide 27. 
Uh, there has been some confusion about the reporting requirements for the DEFRA 15 million projects. So if we start first with the catchment scale projects, these are the red flags on the AGOL tool. There are two things that are mandatory. One is recording all the assets in the AGOL tool. So tell us what you've done and something about it. Tell us about the storage, the losses and the roughness. And the second mandatory thing is case study templates. Now, the EA hasn't released these templates yet, but it will do shortly. And the idea is that these larger projects provide um, an ongoing um, set of case studies to put into the working with natural processes guidance. The third um, item of uh, reporting is the project evaluation tab on the AGOL tool. It's actually called called add benefits info um, that and the associated spreadsheets filling those in is discretionary so we'd very much like you to do it but it's discretionary and that captures information about the whole project and information that would be useful to understand how to run these projects in the future and maximize the multiple benefits particularly out of them so it's, it will be really useful information but it is discretionary if we then move on to the last slide, which is slide 28, um, this is the uh, dashboard that Will created to show all the assets being um, being um, built by all the different uh, groups. You can see there's 486 assets that have been put on there already. Um, the only thing that is mandatory for the community scale projects, the blue flags on the map, is to tell us the assets that you're creating and then tell us about the storage, the um, losses and the roughness. The case study templates and the project evaluation are both discretionary. Again, we'd like you to fill them in, but it's, it's discretionary. So I hope that has been helpful. Um, please, uh, uh, one final uh, thing from Chris Utley at the end of the webinar was to just to reiterate how important it is to fill in this AGO tool. Um, if you're not filling it in already, please uh, get in contact with us if you're having any problems um, and we'll help you get all your assets in there. And what we're creating here is a, 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 an asset database of natural assets that you're creating so that we can show this to the politicians who funded the scheme and show them how much value they've got for their £15 million. Pounds. OK, and that is the end of the um, and that's the end of the webinar. Thank you very much for listening.